I'll be talking about different motorcycle clubs or MCs and their fronts, as well as controlled opposition in the freedom movement and some topics relating to bio to the bio digital convergence agenda from bio banking, the task based economy, and cyber avatar capitalism. And as well, I'll be talking about some of the standardization organizations involved in getting the ball rolling for that agenda, as well as Francois Collier. So first, to start this one off here, talking about Trina Sipico over here. I had mentioned that she had given the Pope the headdress when he had came to Canada, although that was a mistake. It was actually someone named Wilton Littlechild. However, Trina Sipico had decided to post my video. And this person named Osawi, who claims to be an ambassador for Sipico, had ended up messaging me to dispute some of the claims I had made and as well claims to have blocked me. Will likely do so after this video, I predict. However, I said that Trina Sipico can reach out to me if she would want to, and I of course have not heard from her. So if Sipico wants to post my video without addressing me directly, that's okay, that's pretty much just like free press at that point. So, anyway, to move forward here, I'm going to talk a little bit about Wilton Littlechild. So, like I said, he's the one who presented the Pope the headdress. And, as well, it says that he is a Cree chief, residential school survivor, and lawyer who has worked both nationally and internationally, including with the United Nations to advance indigenous rights and treaties. He has also, through leadership with the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, raised awareness of former Canadian policies that decimated the livelihood and culture of indigenous Canadians. And Chief Little Child was a member of the 1977 Indigenous Delegation to the United Nations and worked on the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, also known as UNDRIP. He organized within the UN to increase indigenous input in the economic and social issues the UN tackles. In the 1980s, he worked on the lawsuit to prevent patriation of the Canadian Constitution until the Aboriginal and treaty rights were protected, and in more recent years has been a regional and international treaty chief on treaties number 6, 7, and 8. And he's also been awarded the Order of Canada in 93. The Canadian government awarded Chief Little Child the Canada 125 medal, and he's a 2015 laureate of the Indus Inspire Awards, and was recently awarded with the Alberta Award of Excellence. Okay, that's fine and dandy, I guess, whatever. So, UNDRIP is essentially a land and a resource grab as it allots different land and resource rights to quote unquote indigenous people but does not define what indigenous is in the course of the act so it is bad news and as well it is supported by a lot of the pretendian groups if you will such as the asmin and anyone aligned with the alliance of indigenous nations which i have covered in prior videos i will be leaving links in the description for so what i'm saying is the idea of people pretending to be native versus those who are native like the band councils and stuff like that the common denominator is undrip right there so therefore the pretendian type of argument is well somewhat of a smoke screen you could say it does deserve to be addressed, however, it is not the main focus and is used as a distraction around UNDRIP. So, here is a Cree woman named Serena Freedom Bear. Uh, that's what she goes by in the Freedom Movement. Her real name is Serena Winterburn. And I have messaged, I, I have actually communicated with her directly and I have mentioned her in prior videos. So, she basically is on damage control here in, with regards to the biodigital convergence as she brings up Policy Horizons, which she calls Policy Horizon Canada, so that's incorrect. And she talks about Crystal van der Elst, who runs that organization, but she seems to leave out the fact that Crystal van der Elst is also the head of the Global Foresight Group, which essentially works with the United Nations, the IMF, World Health Organization, and several other organizations. So that's sort of like the international tie there that Crystal Vander Elst has. She does point out that Crystal was former head of strategic foresight for the World Economic Forum, though. 
So, and she as well mentions that the biodigital convergence is transhumanism, which is true. However, she is a gatekeeper and she reminds me of corporate HR employees because just because you mentioned the biodigital convergence, it doesn't mean that you're actually against it. And a perfect example of this is the gold stars over here, which we can see as well, Jeffrey Gibson uses here on Atlantic Canada Unity, and I had as well done a stream with him. So for me to explain this gold star thing, what happens is also in the forum for content creators that want not just gold stars, but other digital gifts or even the, the buy me a copy thing. They're just basically Web3 gateways. So when I say Web3, I mean the blockchain. So they're Web3 gateways that lead toward a system where we compete for gigs, hence another term, the gig economy. And basically, we're all competing for tasks and get rewarded with digital assets or tokens of sorts, which basically are used in a social credit score type system. So that is what these things are gradually transitioning into. And also, like I said, Chapri does use the gold stars as well. And same with Ron Clark and others. So I wanted to point this out to him, and among other things. However, I did agree to do a live stream with Jeffrey Gibson on February 6, 2024. And because I had mentioned him in a couple of videos. However, the fact is that the live stream went terrible for him because I questioned him about working with military or ex-military personnel as he had mentioned and he didn't really like being questioned to say the least and as well he wasn't prepared for the conversation to be had about the biodigital convergence and I was mostly leading the entire stream for the most part unfortunately for him and with due respect to, I, I had wished that it had actually carried on forth and I did not get kicked off because many people could have benefited from learning about the biodigital convergence and the many different gateways that lead in that direction and are happening right before our very eyes, such as the task-based economy or gig economy that I had just explained. And that kind of environment which we're competing in would be a metaverse type environment. So. Next, we have Ed Hoyt, who actually happens to be friends with Jeffrey Gibson, so or Jeremy Gibson, excuse me, whatever he really goes by. So, Ed Hoyt has had a history in politics here, as we can see, uh, one of the executives for the People's Alliance of New Brunswick, and as well, basically, he was a campaign manager for St. John's. Um, mayoral, mayoral candidate, Daryl Batarash, and he dismissed his campaign manager, Ed Hoyt, after it was, after he was found guilty of assaulting a woman. So, in a nutshell here, what I want to get at here about Ed Hoyt and Je Jeremy Gibson, or Jeffrey Gibson, whatever his name is, is the fact that they both also contribute to this digital twin idea here. And this digital twin is basically created through our personality and our profile that is built on us. So even me making these videos, unfortunately, that does contribute to that same concept. And as well, creating these stupid digital avatars here as well contributes to building a digital twin and as well towards something called cyber avatar capitalism. And I haven't yet finished speaking about Ed Hoyt as there's definitely more for me to say. We'll get to that momentarily. So cyber avatar capitalism is largely popular in Japan. So Society 5.0 the concept advocated by the Japanese government is aimed at realizing a sustainable society that enables people with diverse backgrounds and values, such as the elderly, foreigners, and youth, to pursue, di pursue diverse lifestyles. Its core values are sustainability and diversity. To achieve this, it is necessary to develop technologies that can complement and augment the abilities of different people in their quest for happiness and to develop a sustainable society with diversity and inclusion. Further, the corresponding 
social system should be changed. By virtue of this, people will be able to achieve their potential and their lives to the fullest. The daunting reality in Japan is a rapidly aging society with a shrinking labor population. These impacts industry these impacts industries collaborating toward the collapse of rural communities, soaring social security expenditures, and evaporating domestic consumption. Japan is not alone in this situation. Several countries, particularly in East and Southeast Asia, will follow the same path. So, as well, a range of techno-social innovations have to be triggered and implemented globally to achieve the vision of Society 5.0. Working Group 1 proposes research and development on cybernetic avatar technology and avatar capitalism. As associated, techno-sociological transformation can be one of the major pathways for creating Society 5.0. Cybernetic avatar technology enabling capability complementation and augmentation to meet diverse needs of diverse people should be promoted to realize society 5.0 capability complementation and augmentation implies that each individual can expand their own abilities by overcoming the limitations of the human body brain and space and time it is important to establish technology that can enable this the technology will be a merger of artificial intelligence cyborg material science and biotechnology built on an ultra high speed low latency global network cyber avatar capitalism is the associated sociological transformation where avatars are considered social capital enabling anyone to pursue various lifestyles that is currently not possible thus liberating the existing constraints of physical, cognitive, and perceptional capabilities, as well as geographic and economic restraints. Wow. Okay. So now, now that you've learned a little bit about cyber avatar capitalism, here's something interesting about it, Ed Hoyt, all right? So he has this crazy Indian's brotherhood vest of sorts, and as well, he calls himself a one percenter over here, as we can see. Okay, so then you have Donnie Wanch as well, part of the Crazy Indian Brotherhood, and I believe as well president of the organization, at least national president of Canada. And then we also have him wearing an Outlaws 1 Percenter shirt. So is it possible then that the Crazy Indian Brotherhood and the 1 Percenter Outlaws are one in the same? I will read a little bit about the Crazy Indian Brotherhood and about the American Outlaw Association. The main goal is to assist Aboriginal men who are trying to leave the lifestyle of crime, violence, and addiction. Remember, our doors are open to all nationalities wishing to accomplish these objectives for themselves and their families. As brothers, we try to stay focused and abide by the seven grandfather teachings of Courage, honesty, humility, truth, wisdom, love, and respect. We promote compassion, unity, protectors, belonging, and a place to be heard. We want to encourage one another while using kindness and sharing to our advantage. We also have members of all ages, each with different backgrounds, which help us provide some well-nourished advice and guidance. We offer a mentorship program for each individual to compete, to complete, which when accomplished is rewarded with a full set of brotherhood patches. And this is their logo. We believe we are all equals and put on this earth by one creator. And it says we are not a gang or a motorcycle club. We are a brotherhood made by our brothers and for our brothers. We run in the same way a democracy would be run with the majority votes from our members choosing our representatives, if you say so. So now the American Outlaws Association, some degree of history. So that is 1965. However, in 1935, this is when the McCook Outlaws Motorcycle Club is established outside of Matilda's Bar on Old Route 66 in McCook, Illinois, just outside of Chicago. So they technically predate the Hells Angels who were around at first in 1948, from my understanding. 
And so by the time 1965 came around on January 1st, the American Outlaws Association was born. The back patch of the club, skull, and cross pistons is named Charlie. Okay. So as well, you have, all right, so the American Outlaw Association right here, we can see it incorporated in 1965 as we see and it's described as a one percenter motorcycle gang here okay so and they're on board the sustainable development goals there are 17 of them and they're for number 16 peace justice and strong institutions and so every time you read the sustainable development goals such as good health and well-being just always think about the exact opposite especially when these goals come through from the United Nations, which essentially encroach on land and do all kinds of resource grabs and pretty much really were, they were formed at the end of World War II. And essentially in World War II, both the Axis and Allies were funded by Switzerland. So essentially you have an artificial or rather a major conflict that is created and then they create the artificial solution which in this case happened to be the United Nations and the United Nations are what run the sustainable development agenda and seem to be a central point in all of this and as well work hand in hand with the organization that Crystal Vander Elst is a part of so that would be they work with Policy Horizons and as well the Global Foresight Group. That was the organization I was thinking of. So as well you have the Hells Angels MC as well on board with the Sustainable Development Agenda. So now I'm going to read a little bit about something called Red Rum, which is another motorcycle club however they claim not to be associated with the other MC groups but we're gonna look at some common grounds that they all have so it's an indigenous based motorcycle club founded in 2006 on the foundation of the Red Road with a focus on brotherhood motorcycling community respect and responsibility fundraising and supporting family and it is not a 1% MC and are not affiliated with any other MCs. We send love and respect to all MCs and ask them to respect the fact that we are a First Nations people MC. Our mission is to bring Native American bikers, brothers, and supporters who wish to follow the Red Road together so we can help our communities in need, not only Indigenous, but all in need. All right. And also, they do not claim any territory as they wear a First Nations rocker, which means they represent the indigenous peoples known as First Nations. One does not have to prove Native American heritage or be Native American to believe in traditional ways of living and sharing community and family to be a member of Red Rum. And so they have chapters all over the United States as well as some in Canada and definitely there's fewer in Europe and then even fewer in Asia. It mentions Thailand here on this website but I'm pretty sure as well there's a chapter in Japan. So here is the leader of Red Rum, the president if you will, attending the UN. His name is Cliff Matthias. So here, time to move forward here. He is the president, the international president of the Red Rum Motorcycle Club, and as well the cultural director of the of Red Hawk of Red Hawk Native American Arts Council in Brooklyn, New York. So here are some photos of him again at the UN. And so it says that they're the first MC group to ever fly on the floor of the UN. And as well, he says, representing my people and Red Rum Motorcycle Club as we attend the United Nations Permanent Forum on Indigenous Peoples. To say we are warriors for the people, we must first listen to the people. Okay, so the 
United Nations Permanent Forum on Indigenous Peoples is one of the many facets of the UN that is supporting UNDRIP, which again is a land and a resource grab in a nutshell, and has nothing to do with respecting culture and anything of the sort. So we, you could see that basically either these organizations are these organizations are basically constructed for the purpose of appearing like community-based organizations, but really are just United Nations fronts. And we can see here as well that he is, Cliff Matthias is acquainted with Jason Momoa, the guy who played Aquaman in movies, and he's as well been on Game of Thrones. So while they claim not to um, be part of the, part of any other motorcycle club or affiliated with them, Jason Momoa appearing in a photo with someone from the Hells Angels here doesn't mean that Red Rum and the Hells Angels are linked together, but where they are linked is the United Nations, right? So they follow United Nations agendas of sorts. And so what is much bigger than UNDRIP or any of the other, we'll say small potato agendas, if you will, is the biodigital convergence, which ultimately has to do with fusing biological life with digital and in a nutshell doing that kind of blurs people's reality if you will and leads to so many other issues in which I will be discussing here so this particular uh, Red Hawk Native American Arts Council which Cliff Matthias runs basically they are funded by and supported by several organizations the Two most distinct that I can see on here that I've spoken about in other uh, videos. I've not spoken about Mellon Foundation, but that's one of the prominent ones here. And then the Rockefeller Brothers Fund, I as well have spoke about in my Israel-Palestine video. So basically you have the international president of a motorcycle club that is welcome on the, on the United Nations floor, supports UNDRIP, and other different things that exploit different communities including the native community as well as others because when it comes down to not being able to properly define the word indigenous for in the case of UNDRIP and granting these land and resource rights to people it doesn't matter if someone is First Nations or not just them being able to identify as indigenous and getting that sort of pass if you will just like the Asmin and these other pretendian groups, if you will, give out these passes. This will create a lot of confusion and disharmony in society. And so nothing will ever be rectified in any way with some kind of approach like this. And unfortunately here it appears that Cliff Matthias is standing on the wrong side. And if anybody here, whether they are part of an MC or just otherwise, anybody, think about your family and your children. Do you want them to live in a future where you have a social credit system and you're competing for different gigs and tasks within the boundaries of the metaverse, if you will? When these people talk about open borders, you're not talking about severing the border between Canada and the United States or the U.S. and Mexico or whatever. You're talking about open borders in terms of the context of the metaverse is what they're really talking about. So in order to sever all borders, they create an entirely new world, right? And the new world order does revolve around bio-digitalization, in which case this is where transhumanism as a term comes into play. And so this particular article I'm only going to read the uh, abstract there that I had because the article is not so um, technical in nature and doesn't really explore a lot of details or give anything really in depth it just speaks in a manner that more like tries to normalize the idea of transhumanism and talking about how it could potentially benefit society if you will and the idea in which it's not beneficial remotely by the way and then with the idea of what they call inclusion or inclusivity, it's really just about accepting 
these things and social engineering and of course as well controlling what people think can say and can do etc so this project addresses the possible futures of transhumanism and the effects on culture and society those futures could create history has shown us that when social and political systems are not created for and by the people they serve they often do not serve those people's best interests and turn into sexist racist and classist systems how might we ensure that the, the directions biomedical designers and engineers pursue to create future biomedical devices are informed by the wishes and concerns of the people who will be integrating these devices into their bodies Similarly, how can policymakers work closely with people seeking to improve their lives through bionic integration so that the system is designed to include people in need who are otherwise already disadvantaged and not simply to provide benefits only to a privileged few? The project aims to create a set of future implications which will help guide and decolonize the future of healthcare policy, biomedical design, and the transhumanist movement as a whole. So I'm going to be talking about the biomedical design in particular as I move forward. However, once again, like in terms of the idea of inclusion, they are trying to bring absolutely everybody on board this agenda and to accept a different kind of new normal, if you will. And I'm going to be talking about that a little bit further as I go into what's called the future of sense making with policy horizons. However, first I will talk about biobanking, if you will. So the term biobank first appeared in scientific publications in 1996. There is still no agreement on a precise definition. The term biobank has been gradually adopted to describe any collection of collections of biospecimens or human genetic data suitable for research purposes. One of the first definitions, a collection of biological material and the associated data and information stored in an organized system for a population or a large subset of a population was introduced by the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development, OCED. This description was later updated to depict biobanks as structured resources that can be used for the purpose of genetic research and which include a human biological materials and or information generated from the analysis of the same and b extensive associated information. One unavoidable feature of biobanking is the coexistence of biological specimens and associated data. Biobanks are large collections of human biological materials linked to relevant personal and health information, which may include health records, family history, lifestyle, and genetic information that are held predominantly for use in health and medical research. Interestingly, the document produced by the International Organization for Standardization, illustrating the general requirements for biobanking we're going to be looking at this particular standard here defines biobanks as legal entities or parts of a legal entity that perform biobanking and states that biobanking is the process of acquisitioning and storing together with some or all of the activities related to collection preparation and preservation and testing analyzing and distributing defined biological material as well as related information and data so the ISO the International Standard Organization is an independent non-governmental international organization even though they work with government in which 165 national standards bodies participate with one member per country though the through the action of experts, the ISO aims to share knowledge and produce consensus-based international standards that support innovation and deliver solutions to global challenges. International standards represent documents that offer guidance, practical information, and best practices created by people who will use and be impacted by them. So-called experts, ISO standards, com uh, comprise, therefore, rules, 
guidelines, process, specifications, or characteristics of standardized procedures and allow users to perform tasks in consistent and repeatable ways. Standards set minimum requirements for safety, reliability, efficiency, and trust. In addition, the ISO ensures that these requirements are accepted in all member countries. And in 2018, the first ISO document, which is this very same thing, aiming to define the general requirements for the competence, impartiality, and consistent operation of biobanks was released. This document is addressed to all organizations performing biobanking for research and development. It does not apply to clinical and therapeutic diagnostic biobank, and it has been an important milestone for the harmonization of procedures at international level. And this particular regulation allows biobanks to obtain accreditation for their activities, thus formalizing their competence. While biodigital convergence is evolving at an incredibly fast rate, the conditions and limitations of the outcomes are still in question. Products are being developed in rapid succession and are ready to enter the market, but there is a lack of appropriate specifications for reliability, safety, and quality of performance. This apparent deficiency motivated the International Electrotechnical Commission, another standardization organization, to launch an initiative to identify needs and gaps in standards for biodigital convergent technologies. A standardization evaluation group, 12, SEG 12, was formed with a mandate to analyze the current spectrum of biodigital developments and standardization gaps, but also address ethical issues. International experts in the relevant fields were invited to provide input, which was presented and discussed in an open webinar and summarized in an IEC publication. So, once again, looking at the same publication here. You have ISO 2037, which came around in 2018. And so here, let me just scroll down. The document specifies general requirements for the competence, impartiality, <clears throat> and consistent operation of biobanks, including quality control requirements to ensure biological material and data collections of appropriate quality. The document is applicable <clears throat> to all organizations performing biobanking, including biobanking of biological material from multicellular organisms and microorganisms for research and development. Biobank users, regulatory authorities, organizations, and schemes using peer assessment, accreditation models, and others can also use this document in confirming or recognizing the competence of biobanks. And then eventually this standard will be replaced by this particular one here. So this is the particular committee that is overseeing the, the biobanking and biotechnology regulation. And the this is the committee manager here. And then you have as well the technical program manager, so which I'll be talking about those people very briefly. It says standardization in the biotechnology process that includes the following topics, terms and definitions, biobanks and bioresources, analytical methods, bioprocessing, data processing, including annotation, analysis, validation, comparability, and integration, metrology, and as well, this particular committee will work closely with related com committees in order to identify standardization needs and gaps and collaborate with other organizations to avoid duplications and overlapping standardization activities. And these are the following sustainable development goals in which they are working toward. So here you have Lena Krieger, who basically is the senior project manager at DIN German Institute for Standardization and of course they are the secretariat of this particular regulation within the International Standardization Organization and as well anything else here 
then we have the circular economy as well. And the circular economy, while the committee manager is different, the same person here, Manja Corder, is also the technical program manager, if you will. And I lied, I don't actually have a tab open for her to talk about her, but I will talk a little bit about Melissa Medeiros here, who basically at, runs, she is part of the digital and innovation aspect of the AFNOR group, which uh, I will need to look up what it stands for. I will probably find out here at Association Francaise de Normalization. And I apologize for the pronunciation there. So, standardization in the field of circular economy. So, what makes circular economy different from bioeconomy is that. This is a folk, circular economy focuses on reusing resources. That is kind of what makes them a little bit different, although there are some common grounds between the circular economy and bioeconomy, if you will. This, just the circular economy more or less has to do with reusing different tools and resources. And so the secretariat of this is AFNOR, like I was saying, and standardization in the field of the circular economy to develop frameworks, guidance, supporting tools, and requirements for the implementation of activities of all involved organizations to maximize the contribution to sustainable development. And what is excluded are aspects of circular economy already covered by existing committees. So. They support 16 of the 17 sustainable development goals with this particular regulation. And so now to talk about Francois Collier. He is a full professor in the Department of Software Engineering. That's Francois of Software Engineering and IT at the School of Higher Technology. One of Canada's leading engineering schools affiliated with the network. He was the chief executive officer of information at ETS between 2010 and 2016 and the founding director of the Department of Software Engineering and IT since its inception in 2004 until 2010. And he has nearly 22 years of industrial experience in one of Canada's largest companies, including where he has held various positions as an engineer and as an executive in systems quality engineering, purchasing computer products and services, and deployment of computer infrastructures, and management of architecture and enterprise, and he has been an observer member of the ETS Council and a member of the Administration Boards of Scientific Information Network of Quebec. He is currently an observer member of this particular board, an accelerator of digital culture in companies and organizations. So he has been continuously involved in the development of standards in the field of engineering, software, and systems since 1984. And he began contributing to the development of software engineering standards at the Institute of Electrical and Electronics Engineers, the IEEE. He was an international secretariat of, the, of this particular joint committee that mixes the International Electrotechnical Commission, I think that's what IEC stands for, and the International Standard Organization, which was responsible for developing standards in the field of engineering software and systems from 1993 to 97, and was its president from 97 to 2017. And he also facilitated the Special Working Group on Technology Watch for International IT Standardization from 2002 to 2007. And he's currently the international chair of this particular subcommittee on standardization in the field of Internet of Objects and Related Technologies since its creation in 2016 and is a member of the Standardization Evaluation Group on Communication Technologies and Architectural Architectures of Electrotechnical Systems. And the group assessment on the standardization of the IEC on tech Technologies, Communications, and Architecture architecture of Electrotechnical Systems. He is also chair of the CSA group, ICT, 
strategy steering committee and vice chair of the Canadian JTC1 parallel committee. And he holds a bachelor's degree in environmental biology from McGill University, a bachelor's degree in physical engineering, and a master's degree in applied sciences, as well as a doctorate in electrical engineering from the Ecole Polytechnique, Polytechnique de Montreal. He is a member of the American Association of the Advancement of Sciences and a senior member of the IEEE and a Golden Core member of the IEEE Computer Society. Mr. Collier received the 2015 Hans Carlson Award from the IEEE Computer Society in recognition of his contribution to the development of international standards. So, yeah, when it comes down to different technologies and different avenues of the biodigital convergence, Francois Collier is essentially working on standardizing those things through different regulations and such like that in the, in the field of Internet of Objects and related technologies. So that could be attributed to like the Internet of X things, which I spoke about in my prior video. And essentially they want to duplicate every object and living thing down to a blade of grass in order to create a mirrored environment in the metaverse, if you will, which is kind of twisted like a kind of mad scientist experiment, if you will. So Policy Horizons Canada, which James Scott has put on my radar and as well we saw Serena, Freedom Bearer, Winterburn gatekeeping over this organization and the overall biodigital convergence agenda. Um, they have what's called the Future of Sense Making, which is just under six minutes long. I suggest people watch it. But basically, they talk about how we think, choose, and behave, if you will, and how they are influencing that. And so this is all about social engineering, essentially. So the four avenues are power and authority, partnership with non-humans, changing spaces, and shared reality. So in power and authority, it basically says that ancient Greeks would visit an oracle for answers in worldly affairs. But in society, similar trust has been placed in academics, university, media, and some religious or faith leaders. But technological and social changes are challenging them. And digital platforms today control huge masses of data and shape information diets with their algorithms. And then you have influencers as well. And also makes people prone to what they call mis- or disinformation, including quote-unquote conspiracy theories, which might make harder to decide who or what to trust. So again, this is all justification for a social credit system in future. And so it says partnership with non-humans, and it compares them to compares AI to human beings, saying that it can also write, diagnose diseases, or make art. I wouldn't really want to call it art, but you get what I'm saying. And it's novel. It's a novel participant in sense making, and it may revitalize our sense making partnerships with animals and plants, directly translating their sensory experiences and and allowing us to feel what they feel. So any sense of natural intuition or perhaps even psychic energy, if you will. They want to have a monopoly over that and take that over where that is just purely revolving around a digital space. And so there's also brain-to-brain -brain technology and such like that as well, which I didn't prepare any material for that in this video, but I'll have to dive into that in future. And then we have changing spaces, which just from being in nature to buildings is different social or basically totally different how do i put it from being in nature to being in buildings there are different social relations but they say that that shift in and of itself is no different than the changes taking place now and i would beg to differ that's just a way to sell you this garbage and they go on to mention climate change transforming the planet which affects what we make, how we make sense of things. And it says the explosion of virtual settings like game worlds, virtual and augmented reality workplaces, classrooms, and parks means entirely novel contexts, equally certain 
to affect the sense we make. So essentially imagine them saying, you know, this area is affected by climate change. You can't go there, but you can go take a trip there in the metaverse. Right? And so all of these things like climate change and stuff like that are really just an excuse to use twinning technology and put different nano sensors on plants and that sort of a thing in order to just duplicate those things in the metaverse, if you will. And so with shared reality, it goes on to mention the common language defined reality in the story of the Tower, Tower of Babel in the Bible, where basically it collapses when divine punishment splinters language and reality. Apparently everyone was speaking the same language at the time the Tower of Babel was up. I attribute the Tower of Babel in this case, or Babel, however you pronounce it, as a mirror of the internet. And the ability to agree and work together depends on us still inhabiting largely the same reality which depends on shared mental models, stories, ways of knowing, and standards for separating truth from fiction. The They claim that things don't need to be perfect but need just enough people to agree on the problems and solutions. Currently our shared reality seems to be shrinking. Yeah, I actually very much beg to differ on it. Shrinking, let me explain. So different organizations that are in line with Policy Horizons and with the Bio-Digital Convergence Agenda, they ultimately create the problems and the artificial solutions to problems of sorts. And so the way in which this is done is basically like problem reaction solution. So they create a problem, we deal with whatever circumstances we are placed in, and then when desperate enough they offer us some kind of artificial BS solution. And so here's something I wrote, especially for those in the MC groups and their fronts in which I have spoken about in this video. Sinister forces we face create problems and the artificial solutions to them. So essentially Policy Horizons, the UN, and standardization organizations work toward various aspects of a lifestyle and shift where the lines between biological and digital are blurred. The narrative is always controlled on both sides, where a problem is presented such as hyperinflation and high cost of goods and living, and an artificial solution to a task-based economy where we're competing for tasks in the metaverse only to be rewarded digital assets or tokens for a social credit system so that you can drink your unclean water and you can eat your 3D bioprinted meat. Any aspect of beauty and harmony are mirrored, mimicked, inverted, or reverted and perverted. And this is not a world that I want to live in and I know that even those, those that are involved in some way, whether directly or indirectly to this, such as the Crazy Indian Brotherhood, or any of the MC groups from the American Outlaw Association, Hells Angels, Red Rome, etc. They, whether they see the full picture or not, but if they decide to go along with this, they're just as much part of the problem as the UN, Intelligence Communities, Policy Horizons, and others. Now, on a personal note, going to the Crazy Indian Brotherhood and to Donnie Watch, I personally appreciate the community work done in terms of clothing and feeding the people. However, if this is a smokescreen for something bigger, and whether that be something bigger and even maybe more small scale than, say, the biodigitalization agenda, which is otherwise referred to as transhumanism or not, then think about your family and anybody and anybody that I mentioned in this video, think about your family and your children as well. Because I don't think you guys know the full concept of what is really going on here. And especially with the United Nations and how even these MC groups and different organizations essentially put out different agendas and things that do revolve around the United Nations and their goals. Those are all small potatoes that probably don't have anything directly to do with the biodigitalization agenda, but all of those small 
agendas, if you will, such as say Undrip, if you will, all you know in a roundabout way do work toward this bio digitalization agenda. And if this is something you don't want to come to fruition, then I would suggest getting together, educating the people, and forming ethics communities, ethics committees, excuse me, and perhaps taking these concerns to local constituents and also forming different networks where you have different exchanges for food, water, and ability to perhaps even grow your own food and that sort of a thing. And as well, also, anyone I have mentioned in this video or otherwise, feel free to talk to me directly. On Facebook, you can find me at Matt Unseated, or you can ask me directly publicly in the comments on YouTube, or even if you run into me in person. That's totally cool, too. But in a nutshell here, human DNA as new digital wallets. What happens is the blockchain is platform for digital ID. And so being that the blockchain is essentially a ledger system of sorts, now you combine that with CRISPR-Cas9, which is basically DNA altering technology. What happens is on the blockchain you have what are called NFTs, okay, non-fungible tokens, if you will, that carry certain data and they're basically like digital pictures, if you will, right? So imagine your DNA being changed into an NFT where it is on the blockchain as a digital node. And that is what attaches to a social credit system where you are rewarded those digital assets and you are competing with your fellow brothers and sisters for these digital assets in order to get food and water and be able to live in this social credit score. That is not a system I want to come to fruition and I don't think that's a system any of you want either. So please feel free to reach out directly to me. Thanks for watching everyone. Take care of yourselves.